Good morning, and a very warm welcome to all who are joining us here at St. Mary's Cathedral in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Patrick Williams, a priest here and interim dean of this cathedral community, which has been a worshiping community since 1858. And so whether you are a regular member of our community or if you are joining us for the first time, um, we are honored that you have chosen to spend your Sunday with us. And on this Sunday morning also, we have the great pleasure of welcoming as part of our team, the Reverend Eileen Farmer, uh, who is now a priest associate here at the cathedral. So let us now prepare ourselves for the worship of God. Welcome. the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord of his God, he himself has made us, and we are is we are his people and the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving go into his courts with praise give thanks to him and call upon his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Exalted is your name in all the world. Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what is man that you should be mindful of him, the son of man that you should seek him out? You have made him but little lower than the angels, you adorn him with glory and honor. O Lord our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever walks in the paths of the sea. O Lord our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. A reading from the book of Genesis, the first chapter, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, 
and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. 
in the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, you angels and all powers of the Lord, O heavens and all waters above the heavens. Sun and moon and stars of the sky glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, every shower of rain and fall of dew, all winds and fire and heat. Winter and summer glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O chill and cold, drops of dew and flakes of snow. Frost and cold, ice and sheet, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O nights and days, O shining light and enfolding dark. Storm clouds and thunderbolts, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Let us glorify the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. day of peace that dimly shines through all our hopes and prayers and dreams. Guide us to justice, truth, and love, delivered from our selfish schemes. May swords of hate fall from our hands, our hearts from envy find release, till by God's grace our warring world shall see Christ's promised reign of peace. Then shall the wolf dwell with the lamb, nor shall the fierce devour the small. As beasts and cattle calmly graze, a little child shall lead them all. Then enemies shall learn to love, all creatures find their true accord. The hope of peace shall be fulfilled, for all the earth shall know the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer, our rock and our salvation. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today is the day on the church calendar when we pause to think more deeply about the nature of God. The church's understanding of the nature of God now taking into account some 2,000 years of experience. For centuries, the church has used the only thing that it has to describe its experience of the deity, words. For centuries, the church has used what is necessarily limited to describe the one who is limitless. For centuries, the church has attempted and often struggled to coherently express its understanding of God in light of the truth and the experience of Jesus Christ. And yet, it is always good for us to think about our understanding of the nature of God so that we might then contemplate our own relationship to God and what that then ultimately means for the life that we are called to live. But if truth be told, I've had a hard time staying focused on the task at hand this week. And I suspect I'm not the only one. Now, it still takes me a while to catch on, but I'm learning that in these situations, when I have such a difficult time focusing on something, it's because that's not what I'm being called to focus on, or at least not in the sense that I had originally thought. So today's offering to you is not a doctrinal exposition of the nature of God as Trinity, my spirit would not let me rest if I tried to avoid what's really on my mind today. And it's not even a sermon per se, but more of a reflection or a meditation on God and country. God and country. This week, like many others around the nation, I was stunned and even shocked. In particular, I was arrested by an image, the image of the nation's highest office holder, walking from the White House across the square, surrounded by Secret Service and even military personnel to an Episcopal church. And of course, we later found out that there had been protesters demonstrating in that same square, while that Episcopal church had been manned by people from across the Diocese of Washington to provide water and hospitality to those protesters. And they were all suddenly descended upon by police and violently removed from the area with a tear gas like agent, rubber bullets, as well as physical force by law enforcement. And these are just the facts of the case. It's just what happened. And after they were cleared away, the nation's highest office holder then stood in front of that church, flanked by senior officials and held up a Bible as if to say that who he is and what he represents and how he goes about governing the nation is inextricably linked to the authority and teachings of the Bible, inextricably linked somehow to God. And I dare not forget that that church he stood in front of is often referred to as the Church of the Presidents. And so it made me think once again about the often close relationship of the church to the halls of power. And what we have therefore, either implicitly or explicitly, played a role in upholding in our nation. Some of it surely has been good, but some of it we surely need to question in light of what we know about our history. Since the founding of the nation, we have prided ourselves on religious tolerance, 
but we have, in one way or another, also identified ourselves most closely as Christians. And we have traditionally been the largest religious group in the nation. So many say that Christian values and Christian ideals are what permeate our society and undergird who we are. And I wonder if I take that to be true, which I do. Actually, I've long wondered what that says about the type of God that we actually believe in given the type of society that we have produced, where we find ourselves repeatedly in conflict about some variation of the same thing over and over and over again. Racism and white supremacy. These are real words with real meanings. And I hope we can hear this. I hope we can hear this without getting defensive or tuning out because these words make us uncomfortable or this conversation makes us uncomfortable or because we believe that just saying these words is somehow being divisive or we believe that somehow this is secular and outside of the things of God. But if we do any of this, it means that we are more concerned with our own comfort than we are disturbed by the black bodies that continue to pile up in our nation's streets. So I hope that we can hear this because I believe that our faith bids us to be confronted by this reality and this particular form of sin that is so deeply a part of our nation and its heritage. Racism and white supremacy are real words with real meanings. It might be tempting to think that what we are talking about is an individual who spews hatred and vitriol with his or her words or someone who walks around with a long robe and a white hood, or a swastika and a torch. But these are only elements of what we are talking about. Racism, white supremacy, supreme, that which ranks ahead of all others. I know that many of us would say that I don't do that personally, or I don't believe that I'm any better than anyone else, nor do I condone that type of thinking. While that might be true and probably is correct in your own personal case, the truth is that there is nothing you have to do oftentimes. It is built into the fabric of who we are as a nation and our history is littered with examples and bodies that affirm that claim. It is now, in other words, a whole system at work. And we'll talk more about that later. But we have made white supreme with deadly consequences for almost everyone else, no matter how everyone else might try to fit into the system. We could begin with the native population that was already here when the first explorers and settlers arrived and think about the treatment that they have received and all that has been taken from them until this very day. And no, Casino revenue is not a substitute for valuing Native people for who they are as human persons made in the image of God and all that has been lost of their generations and culture. You could also think about the forced internment of Japanese Americans in World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor because suddenly most Japanese Americans could no longer be trusted even though most were second and third generation citizens. There was a distinction. They were not the same as the majority. And that difference was viewed as a deficit, a deficit that allowed our nation to dehumanize them and force them into these camps. But of course, the other elephant that has been in the room since at least 1619 is the constant assault on those who are of African descent the racialized terror and violence that is summed up so vividly, and unfortunately, I would add also accurately, in the officer's knee on the neck of George Floyd. Calmly, meticulously, and quite literally, pushing the, the life out of George Floyd's body, despite his pleas of not being able to breathe, despite him saying that everything hurts, despite even an onlooking witness saying, he's human, bro, he's human. Clearly, the officer did not view him as human. 
And you see, the truth is that this is not a one-off incident. We could rightly say that people are marching in the street right now in the name of the Trinity. The Trinity of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. No, these are not isolated incidences where we should be saying people need to just settle down and let the system do its job because history has taught too many of us that the knee on the neck stamping out the life force of this black man really is the system doing its job. This same officer who had some 17 previous misconduct complaints against him and yet it isn't even about some good cops versus some bad cops. It's about our whole system of policing rooted in slave patrols that keeps its knee on the necks of black people and people of color. Our whole system of policing that needs to be rethought. That's possible. It's about our economic system and economic opportunities and restrictions that keep a knee on the neck and stamp out black lives. It's about our healthcare system and access that keeps a knee on the neck and stamps out black life because the most robust access is usually tied to wealth or certain kinds of employment. It's about mass incarceration, beginning as early as elementary school for black and brown children, boys and girls, which begin to criminalize them at an early age and diminish their future opportunities, often channeling them into a system that can never fully break free from. I know that there is a shout somewhere right about now that says, but what about personal responsibility? And everyone has to work for what they get in this country. Nothing is free, no handouts. Well, none of what I've said means that those who are white have not had to work hard for what they have or don't have problems and struggle in life as well. It doesn't. Nor does it mean that there have not been some blacks and other people of color who have been successful and reached lofty heights in many, of Ameri in many areas of American life. Of course there have been. Yet they are still too often the exception rather than the rule. And even their journeys are still marked by the kinds of systemic issues that I've just talked about, which are often not in common with their white counterparts. It's often subtle and unseen and therefore often denied and easily downplayed. And why do I say all of this? Well, I say all of that to say again that there isn't much that anyone has to do personally when there is a whole system at work to uphold injustice, inequity, racism, and white supremacy. You know, if we recall Pontius Pilate symbolically washed his hands of what was happening to Jesus as a way of distancing himself. But washing his hands of things, his distancing of himself, didn't stop what ultimately became the murder, the crucifixion of Jesus. The system still did exactly what it was designed to do, <coughs> to stamp out the life of those deemed to pose a threat to the system a threat to the authority, to the power, to the way of life of Caesar and the others of the upper echelon, upper echelon who are deemed to be supreme above all others. Denouncing, distancing ourselves, washing our hands of the situation will not stop what has been happening since the founding of our nation. It will not rinse the blood from my hands or from your hands. Blood be on all of our hands if we turn away and do nothing. We all bear responsibility. To be clear, it would have taken a supreme act of courage for Pilate to resist, but instead he chose to wash his hands and distance himself, perhaps mentally letting himself off the hook by saying it's not my decision. I don't have anything to do with it, when in fact his inaction had everything to do with it. His inaction served as cooperation. Now, I suspect he chose not to change course because the cost was too great. Possible removal from office, ostracization from those whose approval he craved, and perhaps even worse. Not cooperating with the system takes courage. 
but also has consequences. So what does all or any of this have to do with God as the Holy Trinity? I am not sure is the most truthful answer that I can give. If, however, there is one thing that I deeply believe and affirm about the doctrine of the Trinity, it is that the Trinity points us to an understanding that God's primary mode of being is one of relationship. And the thing that creates relationship, that supports relationship, and that sustains relationship is love. Nothing more and nothing less. God is love, a relationship of love. And the doctrine of the Trinity is trying to move us more fully into an experience of that all-embracing relationship of love. And that's important, it seems to me, because at the heart of our troubles are not just fractured relationships, but what seems to be totally broken and severed relationships on so many levels. Broken relationships because they are not sustained by love. Yet the love of God of Trinity is not a, distance, a distant or distancing kind of love in the face of suffering and pain, but rather a love that draws us even closer, a love that becomes proximate, especially in the midst of hurt and pain, a love that gets so close that it became flesh in Jesus and put itself in harm's way, put itself in harm's way to say that the lives which had been forced out of the mainstream, marginalized and pushed to the side, your lives matter. And that we will not be able to say that all lives matter until we build a more just society that affirms that your life is just as valuable as all others. A love that was strong enough and courageous enough to keep loving while knowing that the system would try to snuff it out. Jesus in his very being, not Pilate, stood up and challenged the system before finally paying the ultimate cost. Jesus embodies the reality that the love of God is ultimately and finally costly. At the very least, because it means that we have to die to the things that give us privilege in order to lift up the lives of the non-privileged. Jesus spent his final three years teaching and lifting up the lives of the non-privileged. My sisters and brothers, that's what we are asked to do. That's the way of life that we are being invited into as followers of Christ, a way of being truly loving in the world, no matter the cost. When Jesus tells his disciples to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, you see, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he was telling the disciples to go and to tell everyone and show everyone about this way of life and this way of loving in the world. Tell them about this way of love that subverts and overturns death-dealing systems. This way of love that takes the knee off the necks of those in poverty, takes the knee off of law enforcement, or takes the knee of law enforcement off the necks of those too often abused by that system. We might say that it takes the knee off of those in law enforcement who feel trapped in that system as well, but takes the knee off of the necks of those with inadequate access to health care takes the knee off the neck of black and brown children herded through the system of mass incarceration and criminalization. This way of love that takes the knee off the neck by refusing to see people who look like me as a threat simply because we are black and takes the knee off, allowing those under the knee to get air, to breathe, to have life. If ever there was a great commission worthwhile to send us out into the world, there it is, to tell everyone, to show everyone, to be baptized in love that is life-giving for those who are having the life squeezed out of them, that affirms their dignity and humanity. We cannot wait, my sisters and brothers, or be so preoccupied with returning to our beautiful sanctuary spaces to decide to have a conversation or to do something. Because if we do that, then we will be following Pilate more than following Jesus. 
washing our hands and distancing ourselves in an attempt to run away from the very problems that literally lie at our church's doorstep. Our tradition says that God's love is perfect, that God's love is boundless, and I believe that. God has more love for you than you will ever know. God has more love for me than I will ever be able to truly comprehend. And God has more of that same perfect, inexhaustible love for every human being on earth. You and I have been baptized into this love that is beautiful, that is awe-inspiring, and that is also costly. It's costly because it refuses to stand by idly while others created in God's image are being killed and dehumanized. Instead, it draws us closer. And so if we have the courage, and it does take courage, to follow Jesus and share this kind of love with all the world, beginning right here in our nation, our country, and in our city, our work will be long, our work will be difficult, and our work will be costly in all sorts of ways. And yet, yet, I will remind you of the very last thing that Jesus told his disciples. He said, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. He doesn't send us out into the world and say, good luck with that. No, he has promised to be with us until the end. He joins us in the struggle to unleash the power of God's love in the world, the struggle to bring hope where there only seems to be despair, the struggle to bring life and for all the world we can only see death and the struggle to lift the knee off the throat of God's beloved people. Good news for those who need to hear it. This good news of God can truly be good news for our country. I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, liberator, and life giver. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. A collect 
for Trinity Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory. O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A Collect for Peace Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love. So mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Collect for the Human Family. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A Collect for Mission. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The prayers of the people of St. Mary's Cathedral. A grateful heart prepares the way. As you are generous to us, may we be generous to others. As you forgive us, may we learn to forgive others. As you love us, may we grow to love our sisters and brothers of every race, creed, and nation. We pray for the well-being of all, for the relief of sufferings, for bonds of commonality confirmed. You call us to serve. Be our strength in all we do. Gracious God, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, guide the hearts and minds of the search committee and our entire faith community as we choose a new dean. May we find a loving pastor, a dedicated servant, and a visionary leader. You call us to serve. Be our strength in all we do. We pray for those who bear the authority of government in this and every land especially Donald, our president, Bill, our governor, and Jim and Lee, our mayors, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. You call us to serve. Be our strength in all we do. For those we love who are sick or enduring hardship, especially Thomas Wernham, Quentin Perry, Kaki Whitley, Ronnie Rogers, Dave Della Rocco and family, Sally Walcott and family, Sheila Rudy, Nick French, all those on the cathedral prayer list and those we now name. May we assist in their healing. For those who have passed from this life, especially Burt Bond, Willie D. Green, George Floyd, Bill Whitley, Brianna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, and those we now name. You call us to serve. Be our strength 
in all we do. For the churches of the world, let us pray especially today for our Cathedral's Finance Committee. In the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Mexico, and in our Diocese, for Trinity in the Fields, Mason. For the spreading of your light and life, for the healing of all divisions, for courageous social action that speeds your dream for the world. You call us to serve, be our strength, and all we do. We pray in thanksgiving for those who celebrate a birthday this week. Agnes Stark, Yosef Baleen, Eugene Ferris, Dennis Hazlett, Rowlett Scott, Lyndall Grebe, and Nancy Mardis. We pray with great expectations for those awaiting the birth of a child, Forrest and Kayla Williams. We give great thanks for the arrival of Justin and Amber Price's newest family member, Langston Eklund. For all the magnificence of this life and for all the blessings we name, you call us to serve, be our strength in all we do. Every creating God, be with us all as the pall of this COVID-19 pandemic falls upon this fragile earth which is our island home. We hold in our hearts and prayers all who are suffering in our nation from sea to shining sea. We pray for the whole world and our common anxiety. We pray for world leaders as they chart these unknown waters, strengthen them to walk into the light of a new healing day for the whole planet. Help us to cross our broken lands and be for each other bridges back to heaven. Lift the cares to which we cling. Descend, O oh God, on us all to be our guest. Show us how to find in everything blessing and rest. May this be our prayer. While we do not know how to pray, and until the last light lingers in the West. Amen. God, who made the earth and heaven, darkness and light, you the day for work have given, forest the night. May your angel gods defend us, Slumber, sweet, your mercy send us. Holy dreams and hopes attend us all through the night. And when morn again shall call us to run life's way, May we still whatever befall us, your will obey. From the power of evil hide us, in the narrow pathway guide us. Never be your smile denied us all through the day. Holy Father, throned in heaven, all Holy Son, Holy Spirit freely given, blessed three in one. Grant us grace we now implore you, till we lay our crowns before you, and in worthier strains adore you, while ages roll.
join me in saying the general thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience, by which he overcame temptation, for his dying, through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Lord, you give the great commission, heal the sick and preach the word. Lest the church neglect its mission and the gospel go unheard, help us witness to your purpose with renewed integrity, with the Spirit's gifts impart. Lord, you call us to your service. In my name, baptize and teach that the world may trust your promise. Life abundant meant for each. Give us all new fervor. Draw us closer in community with the Spirit's gifts, empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you make the common holy. This my body, this my blood, let us offer earth's true glory, daily lift life heavenward, asking that the world around us share your children. Spirit's gifts and powers for the work of ministry. Lord, you show us love's true measure, Father, what they do forgive. Yet we hold as private treasure all that you so freely give. May your care and mercy 
lead us to our just society with the Spirit's gifts empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you bless with words assuring I am with you to the end. Faith and hope and love restoring Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.